With the coming of a new Mortal Kombat movie, this one appearing R-rated with the brutality intact, it's once more time for everyone to dust off their standard and obligatory takes of will this be better than the original movie? And will this movie finally break the video game curse? After all, the first Mortal Kombat movie came out in the 1990s, an era that saw a lot of failing video game films like Super Mario Bros. The Mortal Kombat arcade game was also more notable in the 1990s for its deadly and bloody killing moves that were not vividly portrayed in the PG-13 movie adaptation. And while everyone else pops up with their articles and rants about how this new Mortal Kombat movie is far superior to the first film because Sub-Zero made a dagger out of blood, I'd like to submit Admit that the 1995 Mortal Kombat movie is good, actually. It's no action masterpiece, and it's incredibly ridiculous at times that goes straight into goofy B-movie territory. But for what the film set out to be, it is one of the brighter highlights from the darker days of early video game movies. That's a low bar to cross, I know, but it's still the one video game movie of the decade I have absolutely no qualms about rewatching for fun. So what makes this film good? Well, for starters, the production was leagues above other video game movies at the time. Super Mario Bros. went through numerous rewrites and on-set script changes that continued to mount to the point that the actors just gave up reading the script, since everything just kept changing during the production. Simply put, nobody could agree on what that film was supposed to be. Street Fighter was a film that was rushed so quickly into production that the screenwriter was given about a weekend to conceive the script, and the problems that occurred during production with John claude Van Damme's drug problems and Raul Julia's illness made the production a mess. I still have a soft spot for the silliness of Street Fighter, but we're talking about Mortal Kombat in this video. The Mortal Kombat movie actually had a clearer vision from the people behind the production. Producer Lawrence Kazanov became interested in Mortal Kombat after witnessing the coming of Mortal Kombat 2 in 1993. This led to him trying to negotiate his way into acquiring the rights to produce a film based on the emerging franchise. He met with Midway Games chief Neil Nicastro and apparently pitched the idea of the movie thusly. This is Star Wars meets Enter the Dragon. This is not just an arcade game. This is a whole phenomenon. If you give me the rights to this, I promise you I will produce this. Not just in movies, but in every medium in the world. The first reaction by Neo was that he said Kazanov was full of crap and that Mortal Kombat was just an arcade game and nothing more. It's easy to understand this cynical response considering that Kazanov met with Midway just after the Super Mario Bros. movie had proven to be a huge disaster. But Kazanov kept negotiating for three months to acquire the rights, and eventually Midway reluctantly agreed. But Kazanov also had to fight with the studio as well to get the film made. New Line Cinema apparently greenlit the film, but not before the studio head came into Kazanov's office, with the script in hand, and shouted at him, saying, I hate this script. I hate this movie. One hour of yelling later, the studio head reluctantly agreed to go ahead with the film. For hiring a director, Paul W.S. Anderson was sought. Anderson is a name that most people know now for helming the action sci-fi franchise of Resident Evil and Alien vs. Predator. However, back in the early to mid-1990s, he was a fresh-faced director who had yet to land a major blockbuster film in theaters. Paul's biggest film in the early 1990s was a small production called Shopping, with a budget of less than $100,000 and starring Jude Law and Sean Bean. Laurie Applian, the associate producer of Mortal Kombat, took one look at his work and knew he was the one. Anderson also happened to be the right choice as a fan of the video games since he spent most of his time in London playing at the arcade, his favorite arcade cabinet obviously being Mortal Kombat. Anderson didn't, however, have much experience in visual effects, but apparently studied up hard by reading every book that he could get his hands on about computer graphics. So Anderson was not only eager to make a Mortal Kombat movie, but he was willing to put in the extra effort to learn the mechanics of making a CGI-heavy production. The casting was also rather brilliant. For the lead role of Liu Kang, Hong Kong actor Robin Shu was chosen for the role. It was a good choice given that he could easily perform the fight stunts required for such a role, and since he was originally from the US, he could speak English well, making him the ideal Asian action star for this film. Robin was initially reluctant about this role, however, and his casting wasn't exactly a shoe in 
Robin stated, quote, A friend of mine from an agency says, they're casting for this movie Mortal Kombat. At first I laughed because Mortal Kombat is the dumbest name. Mortal Kombat? A video game turned into a movie? A good friend of mine kept hounding me saying, you should really go for this. Meet for them. I read seven times. My agent friend had never heard of anyone who had to read seven times. I had to read for the producers, the director, the casting director, the line producer, and then my final reading was with New Line. They were really hands-on as far as picking this Asian Liu Kang, because he's an Asian lead and they're investing millions. It was grueling. Part of what made Mortal Kombat script work is that the actors were allowed to chime in on what did and didn't work. Anderson had apparently encouraged a lot of ad-libbing from the actors for more natural performances. Lyndon Ashby, who played Johnny Cage in the movie, spoke about how this led to a lot of his funny lines, including his jokes about $500 sunglasses. This was apparently something that did not sit well with the screenwriter of Kevin Droney, as Ashby remarked, quote, I remember seeing Kevin Droney at a Christmas party after the movie had come out. And he introduced me to his date and goes, This is the guy I told you about. This is the asshole who ruined my script. Bridget Wilson Sampras, who played Sonya Blade, was almost sure that she wasn't going to get the part as the first choice had been Cameron Diaz. But when Diaz broke her wrist and couldn't perform the stunts that they needed, Bridget was soon chosen and started production not long after her work on Billy Madison. Sean Connery was also first sought for the role of Raiden, but the production instead favored Christopher Lambert. This was also a good choice, as Lambert was apparently easier to work with considering how chill he was on set, and how willing he was to work with the production team on location. Anderson realized how expensive Lambert would cost, and that he could only have him for so many days on set, so he initially arranged to have his scenes shot in Los Angeles instead of the primary location in Thailand. But Lambert was apparently all about shooting in Thailand instead of LA. Anderson stated, quote, Christopher, when he found out, said, forget about that, I'm coming to Thailand. He sensed this was going to make it a better movie if he could be there in those landscapes. And it is. I'm sure his agents and manager and lawyer were furious with him because he basically came to Thailand for free. When he was there, he paid for the rap party as well. There's a lot of wild stories about shooting this film, including one day of filming where apparently Tom Cruise wanted to check out the set and a medic told him to scram. But the bottom line is that filming went particularly smoothly with all things considered, especially for one of the characters being a puppet that required multiple people to operate. There were some instances where fights did not go according to plan and some actors ended up injured, but from the sounds of the cast and crew, everything went relatively well for the production of an action movie. Now I could mention all of this production stuff and still say that the film sucks, but thankfully the film is actually a lot of fun. Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa as the villain of Shang Tsung is brilliant. He eats his first scene alive, scowling into the camera about how he's going to take your soul. I can't get enough of him. He's the perfect villain for a film like this. Robin Shu makes a great protagonist with his cool delivery, never seeming overly cocky, but always entering into situations with competence. Lyndon Ashby has just the right level of snark and charm, never becoming annoying as the comic relief character. Bridget Wilson also has some grit to her, and a gutsy attitude to any fight that she enters. And the fact that all three of these central actors perform their own stunts for the fight scenes makes this fight-heavy action film such a treat. Christopher Lambert is also adorable as Raiden, but I doubt I had to mention that for anybody who has already seen the film. He's just... he's, he's just the best, and you can really tell he's having fun with this film. The presentations of such iconic characters as Sub-Zero and Scorpion are also pretty fascinating for how adept they appear. The attacks of Sub-Zero's power to freeze opponents and Scorpion's get over here spear chain also look pretty neat without having to retool too much of them for general audiences. The production values are also rather high, presenting a gorgeous looking picture with fights that take place in a variety of locations. Sometimes the fights are on gorgeous beaches, and other times it seems like they're battling in the pits of hell. Every setting just feels as though it has its own character with unique choices in lighting and shots and all these little details. I especially dug looking at this ridiculously oversized feast that Kano consumes. Like he's eating a full turkey with this massive goblet and what looks like a whole block of cheese the size of his head? 
One aspect that hasn't aged well is the abundant usage of computer graphics, obviously. Computer graphics always make advances, and older films using this technology always look a bit dated. But considering how they're used and where they're placed, the visual effects are surprisingly decent for the era. They also favored more practical effects here and there, including the elaborate and expressive multi-arm monster of Goro. There wasn't too much they could do physically with such a puppet, but with how much they could do, it's still pretty neat. And of course, let's not forget the soundtrack, perhaps the best thing to come out of the movie. I mean, how many people have come to associate Techno Syndrome by the Immortals with Mortal Kombat? Considering the lyrics literally scream it's not hard to have this association. It's no surprise that such a soundtrack became a top seller. Even those who have never seen the film or played a Mortal Kombat game know this song, having been a staple song at gyms and dance clubs. Believe it or not, this electronic soundtrack almost didn't happen. The idea was even rejected by two major record companies. According to Kazanov, we had a deal at Sony for a lot of money. In those days, you could get a lot of money for a soundtrack. No longer. We walk in and say, here's our idea, electronic dance music. And they go, no, here's our idea, Buckethead. He was a guy who played music with a bucket on his head. We were like, well, he's a good guitar player. They wanted Buckethead to duel Eddie Van Halen or something. And we said, electronic dance music. And they kicked us out. Then we go to Virgin Records. We walk in and say, great idea, electronic dance music. And they say, yeah, how about Janet Jackson? By the way, I love Janet Jackson, but we were like, what, for Mortal Kombat? We get kicked out. Finally, we get no record deal. The studio was great by backing us and letting us do that. We made the Mortal Kombat soundtrack and gave it to this little record company no one had ever heard of. And we came out with the first EBM Platinum soundtrack. So even the record labels didn't believe in what Kazanov was going for, and he managed to prove them all wrong. Techno Syndrome is now pretty much the first thing most people think about when it comes to Mortal Kombat, because of how much that song kicks ass. So, uh, that's it. Mortal Kombat is a fun movie. It's also a comparatively pleasing picture when you consider the other Mortal Kombat movies and TV series that followed in the 1990s. This includes the cheaply produced direct-to-video animated movie, the embarrassing animated TV series for kids, the rushed and laughably bad sequel of Mortal Kombat Annihilation, and the Mortal Kombat live-action TV series from the late 90s that I doubt many people know about, and for good reason. There's a lot of terrible video game movies out there, and even terrible Mortal Kombat media, but I would argue that 1995's Mortal Kombat movie is not one of them. Much has changed since the last Mortal Kombat tournament. Dark forces of Outworld have begun invading the Earth realm. These attacks are seriously weakening Earth's dimensional fabric, enabling not only Outworlders to enter the Earth realm, but warriors from other domains as well. Only the most extraordinary warriors could possibly meet this challenge. 